Johnny Tremaine, Chapter 8, Part 3 That musket, which Rab did not have, bothered Johnny. However, the soldiers never carried them while loitering about alehouses and wharves or the stables of the African Queen. They stood guard with them. They drilled with them. They practiced marksmanship very badly, Rab thought. And now and then, over at the foot of the common, they executed a deserter with them. But never, not once, as far as Johnny could make out, did they lead them about. Drilling, shooting, marching over, they stacked them at their barracks, and there was always at least a sergeant guarding these stacked guns. Johnny and Rab dropped their voices even in the privacy of their attic when they discussed these muskets. The Yankee gunsmiths were working from dawn to dusk preparing guns, making new ones. But as long as Rab had a weapon and was, after all, little more than a boy, he believed he had no choice for a modern gun unless he got it for himself from the British. How soon, Johnny whispered, before they march out and the war begins. God knows, Rab murmured. God and General Gage. Maybe not until spring. Armies always move in the spring. But before then, I must have a good gun in my hand. A man can stand up to anything with a good weapon in his hands. Without it, he's but a dumb beast. Johnny had never seen Rab so blocked by anything. Apparently, he went through every situation without friction, like a knife going through cheese. Now he was blocked, and it made him restless, possibly less canny. One day, he told Johnny he had a contract with a farmer from Medway, who was making a business of buying muskets from the British privates and selling them to Minutemen. Rab did not like to ask his aunt for so large a sum. She had little enough to buy food, but she had said, weapons before food. One morning, Johnny knew Rab was meeting the farmer at market. He knew that the soldier, returning from guard duty, was going absentmindedly to leave his musket on a pile of straw. It had all been worked out. But when he heard yells and shouts from the marketplace and the rattle of British drums calling up reserves, he tore over to Dock Square. He had a feeling that the turmoil was over Rab's gun. He was right. A solid block of redcoats faced out, presenting their muskets at the market, people and inhabitants. The captain was yelling to the churning hundreds, Get back! Stand back! Good people of Boston! This is our private affair. What's happened? Johnny asked an old hen wife. They've caught one of their own men selling a musket to a farmer. Happens he comes from Medway? So tis said. Happens they caught more than the farmer and the soldier? They caught three in all. They're taking them over to the province house for General Gage. Gage is in Salem. For some colonel then. No mob gathered to rescue the two Yankees. All by now felt a certain confidence in the British way of doing things. A general or even a colonel had the right to punish a soldier caught selling his arms, and also anyone who tempted him. Johnny tagged the marching soldiers, but it was not until they turned into Province House that he saw the three prisoners. The British soldier was grinning, and Johnny guessed that he had been put up to this game merely to snare the yokels. The farmer was in his market smock. He had long, straight gray hair and a thin, mean mouth. You could tell by looking at him that he had gone into this little business for the love of money, not for the love of freedom. Rab had been shaken out of his usual nice balance between quick action and caution by his passionate desire for a good gun. Otherwise, he would not have mixed himself up with such a man. Rab himself was looking a little sullen. He was not used to defeat. What would they do to him? They might imprison him. They might flog him. Worst of all, they might turn him over to some tough top sergeant to be taught a lesson. This informal punishment would doubtless be the worst. The province house was a beautiful building, and as Johnny hung about the front of it, he had a chance to admire it for over an hour. It stood well back from the rattle and bustle of Marlborough Street, 
with its glassy-eyed copper Indian on top of the cupola, and its carved and colored lion and unicorn of Britain over the door. Behind the house, he heard orders called and soldiers were hallooing, but worst of all, they were laughing. And that was Colonel Nesmith's boy bringing around the colonel's charger. There was a large group of people standing in the street. The hilarity of the British soldiers did not ease their fears as to the fate of the prisoners. Johnny could hear the rattle of men's muskets as they came to attention, and then, all together, four drummers let their sticks fall as one. Out onto Marlborough Street, with the drummers in black bearskin caps first, and then Colonel Nesbitt on horseback, came almost the entire 47th Regiment surrounding a cart. In the cart sat a hideous blackbird, big as a man, shaped like a man, and head hung forward like a molting crow. It was a naked man, painted with tar and rolled in feathers. Three times already the Whigs had tarred and feathered enemies and carted them through the streets of Boston. Now it was the British turn. The Redcoats marched, the Colonel's horse pranced, the cart, with its shameful burden, bumped over the cobbles. One glance had convinced Johnny this was not Rab. The hideous blackbird had a paunch. Rab had none. Before the townhouse, Colonel Nesbitt ordered a halt, and an orderly came forward to read a proclamation. It merely explained what was being done and why, and threatened like treatment to the next buyer of stolen weapons. Then Colonel Nesbitt was evidently a newspaper reader. The regiment went to Marshall Lane and stopped before the office of the spy. The threat was made that the editor of that paper would soon be treated like the bird in the cart. Then they were heading for Eads and Gill's office. Johnny guessed the observer would come next after the Boston Gazette and ran to Salt Lane to warn Uncle Lorne. He jumped into the shop, slamming the door after him, looking wildly about for the printer. Rab, in his printer's apron, was standing at his bench, quietly setting type. Rab, how'd you do it? How'd you get away? Rab's eyes glittered. In spite of his great air of calm, he was angry. Colonel Nesbitt said I was just a child. Go buy a popgun, boy, he said. They flung me out the back door, told me to go home. Then Johnny laughed. He couldn't help it. Rab had always, as far as Johnny knew, been treated as a grown man and always looked upon himself as such. So all he did was hurt your feelings? Rab grinned suddenly, but a little thinly. Johnny told of the tar and feathering of the farmer and also that he expected in a short time the 47th Regiment would come marching down Salt Lane and stop before the door to read the proclamation about tar and feathering seditious newspaper publishers. And here they come, those dressed up red monkeys, but they don't dare do anything but stop, read a proclamation and move on. When this was over and the troops moved on down the lane to Union, Johnny and Rab stood in the street and watched them. Luckily, said Rab, I didn't get my money in advance. I'll return it to Aunt Jennifer. But he stood still in the street, watching the stiff rhythm of the marching troops, the glitter of their guns and bayonets, the dazzle of the white and scarlet disappearing at the bottom of the lane. They'll make good targets, all right, he said absentmindedly. Out in Lexington, they're telling us, pick off the officers first, and then the sergeants. Those white crosses on their chests are easy to sight on. His words frightened Johnny a little. Lieutenant Stranger, Sergeant Gale, Major Pitcairn. Johnny could not yet think of them as targets. Rab could. And we'll continue with this chapter in the next video. Thank you so much for watching. I love you guys. I hope you've reached out, clicked like, and I hope you subscribe to our channel. And please leave a comment. Tell me what you think. Bye-bye.